Coming up on today's edition of Unscripted Faith, my good friend and co-panelist on Hard Questions, I'm sure you've seen before, Pastor and Dr. William R. Glaze, he is in the house. You're gonna hear his incredible journey of how he went from being a professional football player to preaching from the pulpit. Shoot. Well, speaking of preaching, we have evangelist Jay Louder with us. We're going to find out how God intervened and sent someone to save him as he was about to take his own life. He'll share how he's now living with purpose and making a difference for the kingdom. That's what's coming up right now on Unscripted Faith. Here we go! You know what, I'm gonna give today's show a subtitle. Okay. I'm gonna call it The Story Behind the Glory. Okay, okay. here we go. The Story <laughs> Behind the Glory. I am so excited, it is gonna be so good. And our first guest, he went from sacking quarterbacks to now sacking the devil. You've seen him <laughs> on Hard Questions, Great man of God, good to have you with us, Dr. Glaze. Oh man, it's great to be here with you on Unscripted Faith. Uh, I've been looking forward to it since I got the invitation. Uh, it's going to be great. Now, listen, let's just get right into it because, you know, even though I know you, there's some things about your story that you're going to get into that is going to be such a blessing. You had the opportunity to try out for the Cowboys. Right, and right? the Broncos. And the Broncos. Yeah. But before that happened, tell us about your conversion to Jesus Christ. How did you come to find him? Well, you know, from the time that I was eight years old, you know, I had a dream of playing professional football. And, that, and that's what I, I, I kind of, you know, put all my eggs in that, in that basket. Uh, but, you know, as a young man growing up uh, in the city, you know, there's a lot of things that you can get involved with. And, you know, so I got into that lifestyle of, you know, drugs and, and party, and, uh, and, and, and that was what I was all about. Uh, you know, I, I shared the story that, uh, you know, I, I was doing pretty good, and I had, you know, scholarships to uh, University of North Carolina, uh, Penn State, uh, and a couple other places. But you know, you got to have the grades and the SAT. I had the grades, but I was uh, partying the, uh, the night before I had to take the SAT. And, and so I remember going down to take the SAT, and man, I was so out of it that I kind of, you know, put my head down. And uh, when I woke up, uh, the person that was leading the SAT said, okay, everybody uh, put your pencils down. <laughs> And I kind of slept through the whole thing, man. You slept through your SAT? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because I, I, I was out partying the night before. So, you know, but, you know, just to show you, you know, God's intervention, yeah. that I was able to uh, get a scholarship uh, to a school out in Colorado, uh, you know, where I, you know, played four years out there. And uh, again, going back to that party lifestyle, you know, when I got there, you know, that's, that's all that I did, man, you know. And so the first year, I think that uh, I ended up with a .08 grade point average. And so they asked me not to, not to come back. Uh, and, and, you know, and I came back to Pittsburgh, man, and I got a job in the steel mills. And I was kind of like, man, you know, making money. I bought a car, had an apartment. But, you know, I just said, this, this is not the life for me, man. You know, I, I, I knew that you know, there was other things that I wanted to do. So I called the coach, and the coach, you know, wanted me to come back. And so, you know, he kind of worked some things out to help boost up my transcript. Uh, you know, one, and, and I'm just going to tell you, how, I, I, I don't know if they do college football players like this today. But back in the day, man, you know, uh, I remember he got this course that I took. Never, ne never set foot in, uh, in the class. You know, and it was, uh, the, the title of the course was The History of Ghost Towns in Colorado. And I got a B out of that class, man. What? <laughs> <laughs> ne 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 never went there, man. But, you know, uh, ended up getting eligible and, and realizing that, you know, this is really what I wanted to do. And, and so, you know, it was in, in that process of time that I came back home, you know, for a break. And one of my guys, man, it was, it was inter that I hung with in high school. And, and this was a guy who turned me on to my first joint of marijuana. Wow. And you know, I remember we were sitting on a bridge and he came by and he said, hey, you guys wanna get high? I didn't know anything about marijuana or anything else. You know, but he has, and we got, you know, we got high. And so, you know, we were pretty much, you know, I came back home for a break and you know, we were pretty much in the same, on that same bridge, the same guy that gave me my first joint of marijuana. He came and he began to talk to us about Christ. Oh, and, wow. uh, and he asked me, you know, 
because, you know, I, and, and, you know, I was with the guys, man. You know, I didn't want to show any weakness. And so, you know, he came and he was talking to us about Christ. And, and those guys, when he left, they said, oh, man, I'm glad he's gone, you know. And I kind of went and said, uh, you know, man, I, I'd really like to, uh, you know, talk to you. And so he asked me to go to church with him. Uh, it was a Sunday evening. And so I went to church with him. And, um, you know, I remember, man, this was, a, now, again, I'm a brother from the hood, right? Uh, this was an all-white church, man. And, you know, the guy, uh, the preacher gave the invitation. And, uh, you know, I'm sitting there, and, uh, and he says, if you want to accept Christ, come forward. And, I, you know, the first thing the devil put in my mind, man, you know, you don't want to go in front of all these white people, you know. And I kind of just, <laughs> you know, I just kind of stayed back a little bit, man. And, you know, but my friend, and I just happened to, you know, look up at him. And he was uh, smiling and it's almost like his face was saying, yeah, go ahead, you know, go ahead. And so I, I went and uh, that night I accepted Jesus Christ wow. as my Lord and Savior. Wow. And, uh, you know, I remember, man, it was thundering and lightning outside. And it was like my whole world lit up, you know, after I had accepted Christ. And, and I always wondered, you know, why that was. And, and, you know, as I began to study and grow in the Lord, I found out, you know, what exactly happened. It was that night, man, that the Lord lifted that sin burden off me, Amen. Wow. you know, and I just felt like my whole world had, had got lighter. And so, you know, with that said, I'm saying now, you know, I can go and, uh, you know, I, I, I know the Lord is going to let me play professional football, you know. And, and, and so I was excited, uh, went back, you know, uh, you know, continue to play football and uh, I graduated. And, you know, these opportunities for, you know, me to try out with the Dallas Cowboys and the Denver Broncos. And, you know, my first uh, try out was with the, uh, with the Cowboys. And I remember flying into Dallas and I had, you know, this suit on. And uh, as soon as I got off the plane, you know, I heard this shh. And my pants, man, had split, you know, all the way down. Oh, <laughs> man. And they lost my luggage, man. So, oh, my goodness. So, you know, I'm, I'm walking around, man, you know, just trying to, you know, stay. Get everything covered up. Yeah, stay, stay yeah, together, right. you know. And so, you know, as, as I began to look at that, man, I, I said, well, I guess that was kind of maybe the Lord's way of telling me that. Was that kind of like where he told Saul, I'm tearing the kingdom away from you? Yeah, and right. Tearing football. <laughs> right, right, right. So, I mean, it was like a, a, a day before I got my, so, I mean, the whole time that I'm there, man, you know, this, you know, I'm, I'm dealing with that. Uh, so, you know, go try out, you know, ended up getting cut. Uh, next year, I got an invitation to go try out for the uh, Denver Broncos, and uh, you know, I, you know, I was there. And then when I didn't make the cut, you know, I remember sitting in a hotel room, and you know, again, like I said, from eight years old, man, this is what I wanted to do. You know, I wanted to play professional football, and it just seemed like all my dreams were shattered. And and I remember it was like the Lord spoke to me and said, "Okay, you got it out of you now." And, uh, and I said, yeah. And it was right then, man, that the Lord called me to preach, man. And uh, you know, right there in that hotel, he said that, you know, now you, you, we're, we're done doing it your way. And you know, let's, let's, yeah. let's do it my way. And so, you know, from that point on, man, I've been pursuing the call. Well, pursuing the call, we've got about a couple of minutes left or so. I want you to talk about what gets, keeps you up at night in a good way yeah. what gets you up in the morning right what's your passion i mean you're very intellectual i've known you that as that i mean you're a, a big fan of the word you've written 14 different books but what's really in you that gets you like this is why dr glaze is necessary this is what gets me up every day right well you know the people at my church will tell you that one of my goals is to stamp out biblical biblical illiteracy mm -hmm. you know the you know the one of the largest denominations in the the world today is the denomination of the ignorant brethren. Paul said, I will not have you, <laughs> right? So, so, you know, uh, so that's my passion, man, is just that people would understand the word of God, uh, that they would know God's word, you know, the reason for the books, you know, God has opened up doors for me to, you know, be on gotquestions.org, uh, I answer Which questions. Which I think is outstanding. Yeah. I never yeah. knew that. Yeah. You're on yeah. Got Questions. So is there a way for people to know which ones you wrote or not? Yeah, well, yeah, there's a couple, because uh, they, well, they don't put, you know, the names on them. Uh, so, you know, a lot that of the theological questions. But the main, one of the main things I do is that they get questions every day. And so, you know, they'll send those questions to me, and I, I'm, I'm answering wow. at least a, a question once or twice a week, pretty awesome. much like we do on, on hard questions. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, so that, that's my passion, man, is, is getting out the Word of God. You know, we have a Bible institute at our church yes, you know, where we teach, you know, uh, theology, apologetics, hermeneutics, you know, all those things. 
and uh, and the daily radio program, you know, yeah. uh, Monday through Friday. Again, you know, the passion, Jay, is getting out the word of God. You know, that's 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 where my heart and passion are. Amen. Amen. It's amazing. Like I love that you said since eight years old you were passionate about football and want to be a pro player. But you're in the pulpit now. Was there any clue when you were a little boy or coming up as an adolescent that you had this giftedness inside of you that would prepare the way for the pulpit in the future? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I didn't go to church. I wasn't raised in a Christian home. So there was nothing in me that, you know, said that this was the path that I was going to follow. As a matter of fact, my wife, uh, we met in Colorado at the school we went to. She's a Native American. And, uh, and so she said, uh, uh, I, I never thought when I was growing up that I'd marry a pastor. And, she, <laughs> and I said, well, I never thought that I'd be, <laughs> I never thought that I'd be a pastor. Yeah. So, so, you know, it's, uh, you know, no, to answer your, you know, it, there was nothing in me that uh, ever thought that that would be something that I would do. Wow. So, so I mean, it's just good. What's coming up next for you in ministry now? One of the things I do realize, I was just at your church. You just did a, a phenomenal renovation. Yeah. For me, it always seems like when God does a renovation in something the natural, there's always something spiritually significant that's happening. What's right. going on in your world right now yeah. uh, where, where you're headed in life? Yeah, it's interesting that you say that. Personally, you know, I'll be 70 uh, and I'm looking at, you know, transitioning out in the next year or two. No. Uh, yeah, but from the church, from okay, the church. Okay. Yeah. So we're... we're <laughs> No, oh, 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 okay, no, man, you, that's, that's the wrong kind of transition there, bro. That's the upper taker, not the yeah, upper taker. Yeah, uh, transition out, out of the pasture, no, not transitioning from right, here to I glory. Right? Right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, one, one of the things that we're uh, putting a big push on is next gen. And, yeah. uh, you know, God is like, a, like you said, blessed us. We built a brand new sanctuary and, uh, you know, it's, it's awesome. And I'm excited about that. And I hate, you know, step away from, you know, I, I, I kind of vision myself preaching about 10 years in the new sanctuary. Yeah. But, you know, I realize that, you know, God is, is doing a work. And so we're really focusing on the next gen, a lot of programs that's God and directed toward uh, the next generation. So that's, uh, you know, that's, that's where I'm headed. That's where our church is headed at, at this point. Well, I've always appreciated your intellect. I've always appreciated your knowledge. I love sharing the panel with you on hard questions. You do such a great job with that. And uh, I know you take the word of God seriously. So no matter where you go or what you're doing, I know you're going to be great because uh, God hasn't given you all of that knowledge. A man that went from sleeping through the SATs <laughs> to equipping people with a doctorate degree. My goodness. Thank yeah. you so much, Dr. Glaze, for coming to hang out hey, with it's us. It's been a blessing. I appreciate you inviting me. Thank yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Well, listen, we've got a whole lot more coming up. We have a gentleman by the name of Jay Louder has an incredible story that you're not going to want to miss. We'll be right back after this. We left the light on for you. Cornerstone Network is your home for Christian television. A place of rest, a beacon of truth, your source of encouragement and entertainment. Welcome home. Our next guest has chosen to live out his purpose that God has given him, but that wasn't always the case. In fact, he felt his life was so meaningless that he contemplated taking his own life. That is, until God stepped in and intervened. Jay, it is a privilege to have you with us on Unscripted Faith. Thanks for having me. It's good to be with you guys today. Hey, Jay, have they ever in a, kind of confused us as twins? You know, you're Jay, and it's my <laughs> other brother, Jay. Yeah, man, you got the right name for sure. My brother from Texas. <laughs> That's exactly right. There you go. Now, Jay, you have a very powerful story. You actually were in the middle of taking your life. You were about to take your life, and someone stepped in and saved your life on behalf of God. Take us to that moment and share that with us. 
Yeah, so uh, I apologize. I got a cat that just jumped up on the counter. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I uh, I had a lot of mental health issues, uh, some addiction issues. And uh, basically, I was 21 years of age. I just lost my girlfriend, uh, my job. I'd been kicked out of college. And so it was a real pivotal time in my life, a real tipping point. And I was living with a roommate, a friend of mine. And uh, one day, everything culminated. I was sitting on the sofa, which was my bed, had a pistol pointed to my right temple. And um, somebody pulled up on the gravel driveway, which would have been very unusual. Most people were either in school or they were at work. And um, so I set the gun down just long enough because I was caught off guard and got up and looked out the blinds, and it was my roommate. Well, my roommate worked for his father, and so he had a 30-minute lunch break, but our home, our duplex, rather, was about, uh, I don't know, 20 minutes away, so he never came home for lunch. And so, anyway, uh, when I saw him, it, it obviously I knew I had to stop my suicide attempt, and so I did. My roommate walked in, and uh, matter of fact, he works in Dell Computer in Austin, Texas. And he later told me, he said, Jay, I didn't know what was going on. But he said, in all my life, I've never felt the presence of evil except that day. So, yeah, it was a real, a real tipping point, real pivotal time in my life. And uh, really something where initially I didn't know if it was God that was rescuing me or if this was coincidence. It took some time to figure that out. You know, Jay, I have a question for you. You mentioned something. You said you'd battle with addiction and mental health. I have a background in mental health and addiction counseling. At that time, was your mental health uh, diagnosis, was it undiagnosed? And were you using addiction to try to treat some of the symptoms you were feeling? Yes, I was using addiction to treat some of the symptoms and the depression. Uh, and no, it had not been diagnosed. Wow. It was a different day and time. I was yeah. 21 years, yeah. years of age. And uh, that was... Uh, you know, what you tend to, what, what people even do now in many cases is they isolate. They don't want other people to know. They're afraid, they're embarrassed. And so, no, I had really withdrawn from pretty much everybody. I was forging government documents in order to, to have any revenue. And so I had just unplugged from really everybody. Wow. wow. Now, was your roommate who came in, was he a believer? And like when I hear him explain it, that there was such a presence of evil, did he understand what that was? No, he had no idea what was going on. Ironically, about two months before that, he grew up in California. We grew up completely different. I grew up in Texas in a Christian home. We went to church every Sunday. I was baptized on three different occasions. I thought I was a Christian because I knew about God, even though I didn't know God. He'd never been to church in his life. But one night he came home, he had his own addiction and he came home one night and said, hey, um, I'm no longer, we're no longer going to the bars because we used to go to this bar every, just about every single night. And I said, what do you mean? He said, I gave my life to Christ. And I, it was a joke to me. I yeah. said, you won't make it two weeks. But he started coming in at night and he was reading his Bible. He'd never had a Bible in his life. There was this book called Survival Kit for New Christians. When he would go to bed, because he actually had a bed in a bedroom, uh, I would sneak that book and look at it. And I couldn't believe, I mean, he was filling out questions and writing things to God and so that kind of played into it as well, where God had already changed his life and I was seeing a real change in him. And so I think even that kind of paved the way for what was going to happen to me a couple of months later. Wow, that is completely outstanding. Yes. Amazing. So tell us what happened next and how did you meet Jesus? Yes. <laughs> yeah, so uh, I went to my parents' house to wash clothes and my mother had previously seen a television commercial where there was a guy that was gonna be in our city uh, he was an evangelist. A bunch of churches of different denominations had come together, and they were having a big evangelistic event. And uh, so my mom knew that my life was messed up. My mom did not know that I was very suicidal. So, but she, because she knew my life was messed up, when I was washing clothes, my mom called me into the den, and she just pointed towards the television. And I caught just enough to hear that this guy that was coming to our city had attempted suicide. And so my mom invited me. She said, oh, you got to go hear this guy. I'm like, mom, been there, done that. Church is not my gig. That's not my thing. I'm out. But it created a curiosity that maybe I could go and hear him. I don't want to hear the gospel thing. No, no. But if I could hear, get some tools and some equipment that could help me overcome these suicidal thoughts, I may go. Of course, by the time it rolled around, I had other plans. But 
another buddy of mine bailed out on me and I had nothing else to do. So I showed up and I went to church that night. And again, having grown up in church, as I stated earlier, thought I was a believer because of growing up in church. Uh, he didn't say anything about suicide. He didn't talk about his suicide attempt whatsoever, but he shared the gospel. Now I'd heard the gospel many, many times, but I'd never heard it like that. I mean, he went into the beating of cat and nine, nine tails and cr uh, Christ being crucified and, and he, the words that he spoke from the cross about Jesus saying, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. And then he gets to the end of it. And he quotes John 3, 36, which says, he that has the son has life. He who doesn't have the son doesn't have life. And I'm like, that's me. I'm living, but I don't have a life. I have an existence. And then the final thing that he said, which really pushed me over the line, he said, some of you grew up in church. You know all about God. You can quote John 3, 16. But one day you're going to wake up in eternity separated from God, singing amazing grace. And I thought, that's me. I'm a fake. I'm a phony. I know about God, but I don't know God. I don't have a relationship with him. And I made the decision right then and there that no matter what it cost me, that I wanted Christ in my life. Nobody had to convince me I was a sinner. Nobody had to convince me that I needed God. And I can honestly say in that moment, never in my life before or since have I wanted anything the way I wanted Jesus to come into my life. And uh, like the previous guest, uh, he invited people to come forward. There was, I'm 6'6". I'm six, six. There was a guy below me that I used to play basketball with. I didn't even know he was there. He was the first guy to stand up. But I'd already made up my mind that I was going to give my life to Christ. And that night, that's exactly what I did. Uh, and my feeble, weak way got on my knees and confessed my sin and asked Christ to come in my life and forgive me. And, uh, man, I'm telling you, the change was radical. It was overnight. It was quick. Wow. That's amazing. Now, you have a daughter, and I understand she has similar struggles. Could you share with us about that and kind of where she is in her process? Yeah, well, it's difficult what little time we have, but my daughter has an incurable disease known as stills. My daughter had never been to the hospital her entire life. Uh, she was 18 years of age. Um, like I say, the day we checked out of the hospital when she was born, a picture of health, played competitive volleyball mm -hmm. and uh, ended up with this incurable disease. Mm -hmm. We spent six months straight uh, in a hospital in Dallas, Texas, uh, we just got out of the hospital a couple of months ago. Uh, we were in there another five weeks. She gets a $36,000 shot every single wow. month to keep her alive. You know, there's this mindset among some people that once you come to know Christ, yeah. that everything Tell is them. solved, yeah. that there's no more, any, yeah. no more problems. And while that would be great, that's not reality. Sometimes coming to know Christ creates an additional set of problems. Mm. And it's been a real, uh, just to be honest, it's been a real crisis of faith. I mean, um, I still love Jesus, but uh, it's been a time where there's been seasons of anger and seasons of bitterness and seasons of wondering why God has allowed this to happen. Mm -hmm. wow. Some people don't like to talk about that. You know, some people don't want to hear that because they, they, they want to hear the great side and the great conversion story. And that's all true. But sometimes, again, following Jesus, you know, the Bible says in Hebrews 5 that though he were a son, he stuff uh, right. that, that he, he suffered and yeah. and for us to think that we're not going to suffer because we know Christ is not reality. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that because I, I agree with you. I think a lot of people have this misconception, you know, oh, it was so bad before I met Jesus, then I met Jesus and everything went wonderful. But that's not the case. Thank you so much. And I know now you are a touter, you are an evangelist, you are one who is seeing the lost saved. So in just about 15 seconds, give us a word of encouragement to go out on a high note here with you. Well, I'm going to say two quick things. One thing I'm going to say is, is that God has called all of us to do the work of an evangelist. That's Maybe right. not travel full time like I do and spend your life crisscrossing the nation and the world, but he's called all of us to share our faith. The second thing I want to share real quick is this. Maybe there are people listening that are like me. They grew up in church. They've been through confirmation. They've been through baptism. They've done all the religious things but maybe never had a genuine relationship with Christ. The Bible says in he, uh, 1 Timothy 2, 4, that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And the Bible tells us that there's a time when we are supposed to examine our own selves to make sure that we're in the faith. 
Doesn't matter what you've done. What doesn't matter what mistakes you made. God's grace is always greater than your sin, and He wants a relationship with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Jay, for being with us, and thank you for your story. Praying for your daughter. Thank you. It's an honor. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. When we come back, we'll share our final thoughts on how we can find purpose in the midst of it all. Stay with us. God is doing a new thing. Be ready for it. With your best gift today, request Prophetic Reset, a powerful resource by prophetic leader and pastor Joshua Giles. You'll discover a 40-day journey unlike any other, one that will reposition you under God's powerful anointing, deepen your relationship with Him, and propel you forward. Through empowering scriptures, biblical insights, and prophetic tips, you'll discover how to reactivate your spiritual gifts and faith, release the old to seek Him anew, rest your mind in His counsel, and hear His wisdom for your next season. Even more, you'll witness His word manifest in your life and return to His promises for you. Ask for Prophetic Reset when you give in support of Cornerstone Television today. Every gift helps us to spread the gospel through Christian programming. Call 888-665-4483 or give online at ctvn.org slash donate. Well, I always love this part of the show because we get a chance to put a little bow on everything that God is saying, you know. I was listening to Jay talk and a lot of people don't realize that, Angela, that as pastors and ministers, they see the platform and all that, but they don't understand the attacks. And when I was watching him, I could totally relate with the things. A lot of people don't know all this. I, I started off the story behind the glory. Yeah. And a lot of times they see the glory and you can have that anointing flowing so powerfully and go home and have something in your backyard that you can't deal with. And it's just totally eating away at you. And that can be very hard for us as ministers. Yeah, it's hard. And I think a lot of times we struggle to find purpose in the midst of our pain yeah. or, oh, oh, it's really great right now. I see purpose, but it's not always that easy. You know, I think that many of us are sitting here even today and you resonated with Dr. Glaze's story or you resonated with Jay's testimony of where he is. No matter where you are, you can find purpose. You can find purpose in your pain. You can find purpose on the mountaintop and God is with you. Whether people see it when you're on the platform or they don't, God sees it all and he's with you. You know, what's amazing about Dr. Glaze and with Jay, they both had people that came into their life at the right time. Yes. You know, Dr. Glaze had somebody that came in at the right moment. God never leaves us helpless or never. hopeless. We have to Come be on. open. That's he good. may not That's take good. us out. And sometimes the way out is the way through. Yes. And sometimes you have to walk through that thing, but he's building the glory behind the story when we're walking through those times. Yeah, and it's all for his glory, right? That's right. Everything unto his glory. And that's where also something that Jay mentioned that I thought was so profound. He said the weight oh. of everything that he's feeling. And I was thinking how it's producing the anointing. Yes. We don't realize the grace of God and the anointing of God sets upon mm. us when we walk through those dark times. And it just grows and intensifies. Come on, yes it does. I love that. Everything that God does is never wasted. That's nothing right. that he brings our way, nothing that we go through is wasted when it's given to Jesus. Amen. And so we just encourage you today, find purpose where you are. Know that God is gonna use every strand of your story to bring him glory. Cornerstone Television wishes to thank all our faithful viewers whose consistent prayers and financial support have made this program possible.